The Lizard Wizard's Wish, a derailed fantasy adventure by A.J. Pickett. Chapter 1. An Occurrence at Ogre's Rock Inn. The adventurers are relaxing in the friendly atmosphere of the Ogre's Rock Inn, a well-known rest stop heading north up the rocky coast, where the road travels inland a little to avoid a dangerous and difficult bluff that extends out into the sea for some distance. Said to be inhabited by monstrous creatures which attack ships from the air. And some say there is a powerful wizard who lives there in a flying castle. The inn's tavern room is large and walled with river stone. Many shields, axes and polished skulls line these walls thanks to the exploits of the legendary figure who owns the inn. A former adventurer but still in good standing with his dwarven clan by the name of Rocknar Boulderjaw. Rocknar is getting on in years. He settled down to run the inn decades ago and he has a daughter who lives with him. Her name is Emerald Boulderjaw, and she has lived most of her life at the Ogre Rock River Crossing, which has a small community living among the cultivated and wild trees on the forest edge around the rocky stream, almost to the doorstep of the sprawling inn. She is a beautiful woman, loved by all who visit and dwell in the crossing. The large tavern hall is packed each evening, waiting for her to finish cooking and come out to the tap room and start singing a few songs. Most will tell you she will probably be off to the city and get famous someday soon, and her father could not be more proud of her. On this evening, the tavern is a little less jovial than usual, as a local lordling has arrived to stay the night at the crossing. Some think he may be secretly here to see Emerald sing. Other rumours are that he is here to collect overdue taxes. His name is Lord Kevain Dovewit Smythe. He wears fine velvet and rare furs, Shoes not suited to wilderness travel and a rather ridiculous cape, but there is no argument that he is not a very attractive man, and there seems to be quite a spark lit between the gaze of Emerald and himself when she first lays eyes on him, bringing out platters of roasted birds and delicious steamed watercress. Another arrival at the tavern, not really that outstanding, is a young man who has been visiting the inn for a number of years and is known to be little skilled in magic. Though he is fairly good looking, he is slight of frame and a little ragged. His clothing is most certainly the practical, sturdy, soft leathers that are common to the hardy folk of the coastlands. Most don't know him very well, but the Rockner says that his name is Tastifer, and he is not just a guide to the rocky bluff, but that he is the apprentice of the wizard who owns the drifting tower near the sea. Tastifer is a friend of Emerald, and Rocknar says the boy is clearly in love with her, but lacks the confidence to do much about it. The old dwarven warrior is keeping an eye on the tavern a bit closer tonight. He clearly has no great love of magic, and not much trust for those who use it, but he says that Tastifer is a good-hearted lad, of which he is sure. As the adventurers enjoy the meal and watch the events of the evening unfold, they are joined at their table by the inn's cat named Esper a huge ginger tomcat that loves to be fed morsels of roasted forest birds and will flump down on the lap of the largest, fiercest warriors and purr loudly, demanding further pampering, before wandering over to sleep near the hearth of the tavern's log fireplace, keeping his bright amber eyes half open, watching the scene. Sure enough, Emerald makes her way to stand by the fire. She has changed out of her usual clothing, and gone is her leather kitchen apron, she is dressed to impress, wearing a stunning gown, and no sooner has she finished her very first song, the noble Lord Kevain Dove Wit Smythe is down on one knee, arm raised and proclaiming his undying admiration, his oath that he has never seen more beautiful or talented a woman, and that she must join him in returning to the city, where he shall present her to his father into a life of prosperity in all the finest things of the land. At first, Emerald seems to be charmed by this display, but when it becomes clear that she simply is not going to get a word in, and that the matter seems decided by this young noble, her smile becomes a little strained and her eyes glance to her father, who is grinning at this hugely. Not so amused, though, is young Tastifer, who reaches a point where he simply cannot hear another word from Lord Kevain's handsome face. He barks out what everyone is thinking, but none would be brash enough to say out loud. He does so at full volume and at some length, and as the two men face off across the tavern at each other, both now red-faced and worked up, the noble glances to a few large and well-armed guards who travel with him, 
and nods his head in the apprentice's direction. Before anyone can do much about it, the lad takes something from his pocket, does something with it, extends a hand with a tremendous streak of weird light, hurling some sort of magic across the tavern, striking the noble where he stands with Emerald looking on, shocked behind him. There is a stunned silence for a moment, and a look of horror on the apprentice's face before a woman's scream draws everyone's eyes to the fireplace. The young lord and Emerald just behind him have both been turned to stone. Tastifer attempts to run from the tavern but is caught in the arms of some burly locals. He struggles and yelps, but the men let him go suddenly, as the apprentice starts to shake and shriek all on his own. Falling to his knees and catching himself with outstretched hands on the tavern floor, they seem to have turned green, now scaled and clawed. As he arches his back in pain, the hood of his forest cloak falls back, and all can see that the lad is now no longer human, but some sort of a lizard person, transformed before their eyes by whatever magic he just unleashed. No sooner does this transformation end than the cat Esper leaps down from his spot by the fireplace and stands right before Testifer, growling, hissing and meowing at him in a most unusual way. And Testifer seems to talk back to the cat, finding it difficult with a radically different mouth than before, but whatever the cat said seems to cause him even greater distress, and he slumps to the ground, sobbing with misery, a small, clear glass vial falling from his pocket and rolling across the flagstone floor. Notes Esper the cat is just an ordinary ginger tomcat, but also the eyes and ears of the wizard from the floating tower who keeps an eye on his apprentice when he sneaks into the river crossing to spend time with his friends and Emerald, whom he cares for deeply. Emerald and Tasva both lost their mothers around the same age and have been friends since they were quite young. The spell that turned Lord Kivane and Emerald to stone is very powerful. Not spell magic at all, but some unleashed effect of whatever liquid was inside the glass vial that Tastifer had emptied onto his hands. That liquid also transformed him into a lizard person. Tastifer can barely light a candle or levitate stone with his magic. There is no way he can reverse the effect without more of the vial's liquid, and he says that is simply impossible. He also says that the wizard spoke to him through the cat Esper and told him he is banished from the tower and his time studying with the wizard. He also says he is lucky the wizard did not kill him on the spot for what he has done. He never intended to turn the lord to stone, merely to stun him as he escaped, and for what he has done to Emerald, at this point he would welcome the harsh justice of the people of the crossing that have in store for him. At first, Rocknar wanted to murder Tasper on the spot, but it seems the only way to possibly save his daughter is to reverse this terrible magic somehow. So he will hold off the people of the crossing from the execution of the lad and urge that he be given one chance to restore his victims and thereafter be forever banished from the crossing. Tastifer's transformation into a lizard person is permanent, as is the petrification of Emerald and Lord Kevain, unless he can get some more of the magical wishing water that he had stolen from the wizard tower, and he is the only person who knows the safest way to get to the tower but he is not sure how he can do so now, as he looks so different and the wizard was very clear that he was banished on the promise of a most painful death should he try to return. Chapter 2. Journey to the Floating Tower The adventurers set off down a seldom used trail that leads into the beechwood forest of the rocky bluff, and it's not long before all traces of civilization have vanished from the wilderness surrounding them. The early spring air is crisp and the smell of the sea is strong with the sound of ocean waves crashing across the rocky shore, a distant deep thrum in the background of birdsong and chirping insects. The night's chorus of crickets is replaced by the piercing shrill of sun-loving cicadas, who occasionally fly into the side of someone, being poor flyers easily startled from the perches on the smooth trunks and branches of the beech trees. There are an unusual number of large bumblebees tumbling around in the springtime riot of wildflowers and foxgloves, they soar overhead now and then, but mostly buzz around the rocky outcrops that make the terrain fairly time-consuming to traverse. Not many patches of flat ground can be seen, and it's mostly a matter of finding the best way over one broken outcrop to another, stepping on tangles of beechwood roots as often as stone or the sandy loam underfoot. The sun rises in a clear sky with not much wind, and it starts to get quite warm. 
The way ahead is even more like a rock climbing exercise, and stomachs are rumbling for a little rest stop, something to eat, and a lot to drink. Not long after, a good spot and some shade is found, with a mossy cover over fallen logs and a few rounded stones to sit on. Then, an unwelcome pair of visitors trudge out of the forest, sensitive noses twitching as they follow the scent of the adventurer's trail rations. These large, furry brutes are not wild hogs or bears as they first appear, but mole bears, common enough on the rocky coast, but rarely coming anywhere near people. The beast's tiny eyes are not great at spotting what is ahead of them, so they are quite close when they are startled by the appearance of the adventurers and start to make deep, hissing sounds, very unlike a bear. But their very large, sharp claws, excellent for digging huge burrows, are quite bear-like, and they start to shred objects and dart about quickly, their erratic violence a form of threat display. These rather opportunistic predators may be able to eat all sorts of food, but they are easily formidable enough to add some adventurers to the menu. Notes The mole bears are a mother and her mostly grown cub. They are quite hungry after a long but mild winter and will tolerate some wounds to get a substantial meal out of an adventurer or two. However, they won't fight to the death if there's a chance to get away once they take some significant injuries and will avoid the adventurers afterwards. Unknown to the adventurers, the area is also inhabited by a highly unusual form of marine creature adapted to hunting on the land. A pit anemone is lurking right by the campsite in a sandy depression in the ground between the rocks, its sensitive stinging tentacles just covered by the deep soft sand and waiting for prey to fall into its central moor. It's not very formidable, but the stings of its tentacles can cause quite a lot of pain and slow the muscles on a victim's limbs down, sapping their strength and making the chance of them struggling free a bit less of a sure thing. Pit anemones are very rare and their toxins are very valuable to those who seek out such things. Another random and weird encounter to add to this or another location on the path to the floating tower is a land-based hermit crab of great size, or one of the boulders the adventurers is sitting on could quite easily be such a creature, which will only stir to life suddenly if someone tries to move it, or lights a campfire anywhere near it. Chapter 3. The Boulder Folk Guardians As the adventurers reach the shore, their guide Tastava leads them to a strange assortment of intricately carved rock spires that decorate this whole cove of the rocky bluff, at the centre of which is a great flat patch of rock that seems as though something has snapped a stone spire off at this base and removed it. Sure enough, Hovering in the sky not very far offshore is a stone and wood tower, just suspended in the air by magic, the blue waters of the cove spread beneath it. Surrounding the tower's landing spot, as Tassava calls it, are a number of perfectly round huts made from carefully stacked stones made into domes. These are the homes of the boulder folk, gentle people who survive by eating weathered rocks and don't generally get involved with anything exciting going on. Tassava says these folks are friends of the wizard, who built his tower for him, and could prove dangerous if the wizard remembered to tell them that he has banished his apprentice. Luckily, it seems that he has forgotten, although the boulder folk say that the tower lifted off last night suddenly, and they have not seen the wizard since then. Boulder folk are slow and methodical. They don't need much to survive, but they do greatly appreciate the metal tools that are crafted by other people and enjoy tending to the large hives of the great big bumblebees that have always thrived on the rocky coast. They say that the only way they can think of to reach the wizard's tower without just getting the wizard to bring it back to land is to maybe figure out how to get carried there, and they do happen to know who could take them. Just up the coast a little way is the great Grundle Crunk. He is technically an ancient boulder folk elder, but the fleshy peoples like the adventurers call his kind stone giants. They say they will take the adventurers to meet him and ask him nicely to carry them to the wizard's tower. Otherwise, short of using magic, the only other creatures large enough to carry them are the big marine drakes that live further east in another cove with some sheer cliff walls, a thriving colony of seabirds with the drakes nest right on top of the cliffs. Marine drakes are fierce, but they can be tamed and are strong enough flyers for a person to ride. If the adventurers don't manage to fly to the tower, they can wait a few days. It will float back to the shore and land as the wizard likes to trade and chat with the boulder folk, who really are his good friends. 
He will be quite unhappy to see that Tastifa is with the adventurers, but will calm down and talk with them, even inviting them to his tower to chat about the terrible crime Tastifa performed in stealing that particular item. The wizard is a venerable elven scholar, an alchemist by the name of Pentaleric Star Whisper. He says his people don't live anywhere along the coast due to an ancient agreement with the dwarven people. Even though not many dwarves still live along the coast in any great numbers, you never quite know for sure with dwarves, and even if you do, the elves know never to break an agreement with dwarves. As long as the lives of the elves are, the memory and anger of dwarves lasts much longer. As Tastifer well knows, it's not a potion he stole from Tentaleric, it was a substance known as the Water of Wishes, and it was the only sample of it that anyone owns in the entire world as far as the wizard knows. To reverse the petrification of the noble and of Emerald Boulderjaw, and the condition Tastifer is now in, they will need some more of it, because the magic it creates is otherwise unbreakable by anything short of the magic of the dragons. And that is the answer to the next question, the old elf sighs. To get more wishing water, you'll have to travel to the top of a volcano, find your way into an impossible lair, somehow not get murdered and eaten by the great dragon, and somehow find out for yourselves exactly what the source of the mystical water is, because even the wizard doesn't know for sure. And if they do that, however, they will no doubt be some of the most famous adventurers the world has ever known, because the last adventurers who did this didn't actually live to tell anyone how they did it. Their belongings returned to the wizard thanks to a contingency spell which was supposed to teleport them back to the tower if they ever broke open a special enchanted pearl. All that returned was their clothing and adventuring gear, scorched and blood-soaked, and the vial of wishing water, along with a significant amount of gems and melted chunks of precious metals. The wizard can create more pearls and even send them as close to the top of the volcano as the dragon's influence will allow, but after that, they're on their own. Notes Grundle Crunk is indeed a mighty stone giant. He spends a lot of time in the coastal waters where he carries messages now and then between the coral giants and the mountain giants. As is typical of his kind, he is ancient, wise, not very smart, and really doesn't care about tiny humanoids who he can barely hear through their squeaky little voices anyway. He does, however, dearly love his little bolder folk kin, and will stoop right down so they can shout into his ear the moment they get his attention by hurling rocks at the side of his head. He is actually quite a friendly and well-spoken sort for a rock giant, and is only too happy to walk over to see the wizard's tower. He will greatly enjoy doing something completely out of character for a giant. Sneaking. If the adventurers decide to try their luck with the cliff-dwelling marine drakes, they face quite a difficult task. Climbing up the cliffs is not that difficult, though they will be pestered by alarmed seagulls. The drakes, on the other hand, are large, vicious and territorial beasts that will scream bloody murder at the adventurers, and they most certainly do bite if not qu grabbed quickly and have their jaws tied closed. They can carry the weight of a person and are agile, strong in flight, and can be simply directed by tying rope around the neck and pulling the head in the direction you want them to go. Once you get off them though, they will immediately fly off and rip the rope from their snouts by dashing their heads on sharp rocks until they are free. They will learn not to sit on the nest and just threaten humanoids in the future, but rather take to the wing and attack them from the sky as they do passing ships. The wizard Pentaleric Star Whisper is quite old, even for an elf, and he only took on Tastifer as an apprentice because he has no young elves to train in their ancient traditions. Plus, he felt sorry for Tastifer after he lost his parents when he was just a child. Keeps an eye on the Ogre Rock Creek crossing by sending his mind into the ginger tomcat named Esper, but he can only do so when Esper is sleeping by the fireplace when it is lit in the evenings. If the adventurers have recently killed, driven off, or contended with an evil hag in the Ironwood Forest, he will be greatly impressed and all too willing to help them, even providing some magical healing potions and such for whatever they care to tr exchange. He would rather trade in books, artwork, rare preserved jams and pickles, or tales of the adventurers told over a cup of tea. His tower is his home. It is packed with all the usual wizarding things, 
plus an ornate and complex magical circle that takes up a whole level of his tower. It's a bit cramped in places, and he won't let anyone explore any part of it without him accompanying them. The topmost floor of the tower is an observatory with an amazing viewing tube he calls an ocularis. It's a telescope, and quite a good one. The glass lenses it contains are worth a fortune. He has a tiny fairy familiar, a brownie named Butlerbud, who is quite shy, very formal for a brownie, and can transform into a large and very strong guard dog if provoked into protecting his wizard master at any time. Pentelleric has a magic wand that can cast a sleeping spell, and also uses it to focus his ability to move objects around using telekinesis. He likes to chat and drink tea on a wooden balcony that surrounds his tower near the top level. He is a wizard, however, and really just prefers his own company and his books. He is keen for the adventurers to either be off on their crazy adventure or out of his tower, sooner rather than later. However, he is quite wise and will stop the adventurers to really consider how urgent they are to go to the Draken Peak volcano on a very dangerous quest when turning somebody back from stone or from a perfectly functional lizard person is not actually that urgent. While in stone form, as far as he knows, the two victims will not age a day and as long as the statues are not broken, they can't really be harmed. Being a lizard for a while is no worse an ordeal than Tastifa deserves as punishment for his actions, and if the wizard has time to prepare, he may be of great help to the adventurers, crafting items too and researching enchantments to protect them from what they are sure to face up there in the very domain of the dragons. Anyway, teleportation spells are not as easy as Tavern Tales would have you believe, and there are several things the wizard would need from the adventurers before he can send them to the Draken Peak. Chapter 4. The Training Montage This would be an excellent point in the adventure to introduce a number of different mini-adventures which all focus on three different themes. First is the skills and physical training the adventurers will need in their dragon quest, so something that involves climbing rocky, difficult terrain, traversing dangerous chasms and avoiding such things as falling into muddy bogs or getting caught in sudden changes to their surroundings are all well suited to facing the difficulties one can expect on a volcanic peak. Reading books and listening to lectures about volcanic terrain, wildlife and legendary creatures, particularly dragon lore, is also important. And so is finding just the right items and material components for the wizard's work, crafting magic items and enchantment rituals. Teeth from the Krillif dwelling marine drakes is a good start for an enchantment to avoid detection by dragon magic. The scales of a pearl iguana that dwells on a nearby island inhabited by very large and aggressive mudskipper fish could be used to fashion heat-reflecting armour and flame-proof shields. Trading with the boulder folk for some of their rare and exceptional quality rubies to be used in a teleportation ritual could be a challenge as the boulder folk require so little, but a little bit of blacksmithing goes a long way in their community. Seeking out rare components for spells and items can take up several mini-adventures, but it's just an option. To save a lot of time, you can narrate what the characters do over a few weeks as a sort of training highlight montage. In the meantime, I'll pause the adventure here and we shall continue in the next episode of Derailed Fantasy. Please feel free to share any ideas you have for what can be found on the Draken Peak volcanic caldera and surrounds. Also, what wildlife and plants can be found there and the relationship they have with each other. I can tell you all there will be mountain giants, Elemental salamanders, lava lakes, huge dragon eggs, a massive ancient red dragon, and a massive heap of treasure. My name is AJ Pickett, thanks for listening, stay tuned for the next one, and as always, I'll be back with more for you very soon.